Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my video on understanding the Arduino schematic. Uh, the reason I'm doing this video is because it's important to understand all the bits that need to go in a circuit to support a microcontroller. And a really good way of learning what these bits are is by looking at a schematic that already exists, that's already in production, and that a lot of people already use. So here I have the Arduino Uno uh, schematic, revision 3. So this is basically the original Arduino, but then there have been quite a few revisions on it, so a lot of things have changed. But this is essentially what you'll get on a PCB if you buy an Arduino Uno today. So this schematic is freely available on the internet, uh, and I will be annotating this one while I talk, and I'll be making that available on the internet as well. So uh, it's quite common to see a schematic with no colors or anything on it, so it can be quite difficult to read sometimes. So what I'm going to do is basically just add some colors. And I've already tried to group the circuits into different sections, so I'll just show you that now. Right. So basically, you can break this entire schematic down into these sections up here. Uh, sorry I had to use the yellow but unfortunately I ran out of colors so uh, I'm basically just going to take you through what each of these sections of the circuit do perhaps some in less detail than others but hopefully it'll give you a good understanding of what's going on so the first thing that we're going to talk about is the power supply so just let me grab my power supply color and let's have a look so uh, in these three bubbles, you can see the power supply circuitry. I scribbled this one out because I don't really want to go into what it is, but uh, basically it's just that the Arduino can take its power from the USB plug or an extra plug, and that circuit just allows you to switch between them. It's pretty simple. Um, but the important circuit to you will be in these two guys. So... Here, we have the power supply jack. Now this is where you'd introduce power to the system from like a wall adapter, maybe a lab power supply, something like that. Uh, the first thing we see after we leave this is, let's go down here. Now, uh, that's called a net port. So basically, anytime you see another ground on the circuit, like here, or down here, or here, uh, basically, all of those need to be connected on the PCB, and that's what it's indicating in the schematic. You can also see net ports like this. This one's 5 volts, and you can also find one here, and here, and heaps of other places. So, same deal applies. They all need to be connected together. The last thing is, if you see a label on a wire, that's actually the same thing. So, this, this V in here needs to be connected to this V in here on the PCB. So sometimes it can be a little bit less obvious where they are, but just keep in mind that if your, it's called a net label, if your net is labeled, where a net is just a bunch of connections together, if your net is labeled, it means it's probably going to show up somewhere else on the schematic and they need to be connected. Now, your PCB design software should handle that all for you, but when you're looking at a schematic like this, you need to be aware of it. So, back to the power supply. The first thing in the power supply chain is this, the diode. Um, the diode protects this power supply, and therefore the rest of the circuit, from if you plugged in the power backwards, or had the wiring on the plug wrong, or something like this. So, it's really important to have these protection mechanisms, because... Uh, maybe if you're tired or you're a bit stressed out because your debugging isn't going well, you can really easily just plug something in backwards and it will blow up your whole circuit. So uh, things like connectors that can't be put in backwards are really good, as well as uh, protection circuits such as using a diode or maybe even something more complicated. The next thing we come across is this chip here. Now, uh, this chip is fairly straightforward in its function, takes an input voltage and 
has an output voltage. Uh, this one is actually called a linear regulator, so that describes the circuit it uses internally, and it has a 5 volt output, which you can see go through here, and you're connected to 5 volt. The input voltage is a bit up to the chip, but if you look in the data sheet for this chip, I believe it's something on the order of 7 to 20 volts. Now, uh, you need to be careful because just because it says it can take 20 volts doesn't mean that you should give it 20 volts. Uh, especially with linear regulators, the amount of heat they generate is proportional to how much drop there is from here to here in voltage. So if this was 20 volts, let's say, and 50, uh, 5 volts here, you would have a 15 volt drop, which uh, will generate a fair bit of heat if you're drawing a lot of current. So you should always try and use uh, the lowest reasonable voltage with a little bit of margin above to allow for the batteries discharging. Um, these capacitors, which I've circled in orange, we're going to talk about them a bit later with the decoupling, but uh, the last part we need to look at in the, or oh, this is just a LED that turns on when there's power, nothing really special. Uh, we're also going to look at this, which is actually a 3.3 volt regular. You can see the 3.3 volt net label there. So what this chip does is it takes 5 volts in and it gives you 3.3 volts out. Uh, you might be wondering why we want 5 volts and 3.3 volts, and it's because that uh, there's more than one Arduino out there, and some of them only actually support 3.3 volts because of the chips they use on the inside. Um, so it's part of the Arduino standard that their power connector, which is here, needs to have both 5 volts and 3.3 volts. So basically, uh, you just get your 5 volts, and then you pass it through another regulator, and you get your 3.3 volts. And this is really, really common uh, it would be very unusual to have a complicated digital circuit with just one voltage rail. Um, if you look at a normal laptop computer, it's reasonable that there could be 5 to 10 or even more different voltage rails inside the computer. Um, and this is just because different chips uh, work better at different voltages. Maybe it's to do with some analog effect, or maybe... Uh, when they run at lower voltage, they just draw less power. So that's basically the power supply. We have a 5 volt generated from a something and a 3.3 volt generated from a 5 volt. And as you can see with all the net labels, uh, net ports, sorry, they're spread throughout the rest of the circuit. And that's how you get your power in. The next thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is the USB. Now, uh, this part of the circuit is a bit out of scope for what I want to talk about in this video, so I'm just going to very briefly tell you what's going on. The, the two most important wires are down here. So these two guys here are the RXD and the TXD. These are the interface by which your microcontroller will talk to the computer. You can basically imagine that this thing, by some means, which we're not going to go into today, uh, converts the signal from the USB port into a UART signal, which goes over RXD and TXD. Now, this means that it's effectively equivalent to just a black box, I guess, where this is ground, this is 5 volts, and then we have, uh, I think the top one is TX. So let's go T, X, and R, R, X. Uh, everything else in that circuit, you can kind of work out based on what's going on in the microcontrol section, but we're not actually going to talk about it because it's, it's just too much to talk about for the moment. And then this guy up here is... Uh, it's just a LED. It's, it's not really that important. Um, but next, we're going to talk about the I.O. connectors. This should be fairly brief, because 
There's not much complicated on the AV on this Arduino, sorry. Uh, but basically, uh, all of the output pins can just be driven straight into the mechanical pins that will lay out on your PCB. And the thing I really want to point out is you can see here that uh, it would be quite messy to jump lots of wires through here. So what they've done is they've got AD5 and AD4, and down here, AD5 and AD4. So those two are actually connected by the nets. So on the PCB, they'll be connected. But to make the schematic readable, they've just put the net labels there. So now onto the microcontroller, which is arguably the most important part of this circuit. Um, here we have the Atmega 328P-PU. Now, the PU refers to the type of physical package it comes in. If we have a look over here, this Atmega 16U2-MU, that actually comes in a surface mount package, which is a lot more difficult to solder. But this PU refers to the fact that it's a through-hole package. Now, that's probably the one you want to start with because it's a lot easier to solder, it's a lot larger, so uh, routing becomes easier, and depending on how you're routing things, the fact that it's through-hole can also make things easier. So, uh, it's not actually drawn with its pins in order, it's drawn with its pins uh, in the right way to make the schematic look neat. And this is very normal too. Sometimes uh, you'll see, like up here, it is close to being in order. They've just swapped uh, two and three, but otherwise uh, it's, it's mostly a preference thing. So just as long as you stick to one, then that should be fine. Okay, so let's talk about how we wire up each of the pins on the microcontroller. Now here is very simple. We just connect to 5 volt and ground, but these are a bit more complicated. Uh, these basically con uh, connected to the analog circuitry inside the microcontroller, so that's what the A ref, A VCC, and A GND refers to. Up here we have the a reset pin, which is really important because uh, the reset pin basically tells the AVR uh, whether it should just stop and start again. So the reset pin is what we call active low, so uh, that means that when it is zero or low or ground or zero volts or whatever you want to call it, the chip will be in reset mode, so it won't do anything. And then when it goes high again, the chip will start working from its reset conditions. Now, the reset conditions will change for each chip, uh, but it, you should find in the data sheet exactly what that is. But for the AVRs, I can tell you that basically it means it starts your code again. So the reset is connected to this resistor here. And this is, this is really important concept to understand, and it's the concept of pull-up resistors. Now, uh, we can pretend that using, uh, using Tevin and equivalent circuits, we can pretend that the reset line is actually a resistor to ground. Uh, I can tell you that because of the way this works, uh, it needs to be big like really big, we're talking like, um, I'm gonna guess 500K. Uh, so that's quite large. And here you can see we have a 10K resistor. So we have a 10K and then we connect to five volts. So we'll put five volts here. Cool. So. 10k. Now, this is the point at which things start to be inside the AVR. So there's basically this resistor inside the AVR, and if there's 5 volts across it, reset will be high. And if there's 0 volts across it, 
reset will be low and that will cause our chip to reset. Now uh, you can see that in this default state this is a resistor divider and if you do the maths you'll find out that most of the voltage drop will be across here. So you should have almost 5 volts. Uh, and so in the normal state uh, it will be not in reset mode. Now we have this extra wire that's coming out to here, it's coming out to here, and you'll notice that there are no resistors in line in series, it's just a direct connection. Now if one of these wires gets sent to ground, what's going to happen is this will now have zero volts across it because this is zero volts, this is zero volts, so the reset will now have zero volts and the chip will reset. Uh, and then when we take this away, which I can do like this, then all's good again. It should got five volts up here. Most of the voltage should go across here. Reset is high and we're back to business. Now, the reason we need this resistor is because if I were to take it out, and just connect it like so, let's lose this, then when we put ground here, sure we have zero volts across here, but we've just connected ground directly to five volts through a zero ohm resistor, which is not good. That will, at least mathematically, that will draw infinity amps and that will definitely break our power supply. So the resistor, which we call a pull-up resistor, basically just allows us to set the default state of the line. And it also protects us from when we change it from having a short circuit condition. So you can have a similar thing where uh, you'd want a pin to be normally low and then pull it high by some other means. And you, it's called a pull-down resistor because it's normally pulling the circuit down. So you'll find these in a lot of circuits and a good value to start off with with those, usually 10K. Uh, if you don't really know what it should be, 10K is usually a pretty good, uh, won't necessarily break much sort of resistor value. But you really should check in your specific circuit uh, what needs to be there. So the last thing in this part of the schematic is this connector here. Now this is the ISP connector, the in-system programmer connector, and this is what you use to load the code onto your AVR. Now you can actually just put a socket on your PCB and then unplug your chip, move it somewhere else, program it, and then move it back. But the sockets and the pins on the chip aren't really designed to uh, have continual mechanical stress. So you might find that after maybe 10 or 20 uh, inserts, uh, they start to bend in the wrong way and then maybe you have to push harder on the chip to get it to bend in the right way and it's, uh, it's generally not good practice to keep removing the chip. So, what we do instead is we have this uh, interface, which you can plug your little AVR ISP onto, and then you can load code into your chip. Um, the data sheet that you want to look at, and I'm running out of space here, but it's the AVR910. So if you Google that, it should tell you a lot more information about this connector. So uh, basically, the pins we need to connect are the same pins as what's known as the SPI interface, which is these four guys here. We also need to connect the reset pin, which is here, because the programmer needs to be able to reset the chip because that's how it tells it, okay, I've got some code that I'm about to give you. I need you to turn into a special mode so that I can give it to you. And then we also have the 5 volts, so the programmer knows what voltage this is running on. And we have the ground, just so all the voltages reference to the same thing. So now we're going to talk about decoupling capacitors. 
Um, so it's important to remember that in this schematic, what we're dealing with is ideal components. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know in the real world, we can't really get ideal components. So uh, these decoupling capacitors are a way around the problem that uh, wires actually have resistance. No matter how thick the copper is, no matter how short the track, there's still going to be some resistance. And that really messes up with the uh, ability of the microcontroller to receive power from the power supply. Um, sometimes uh, when this guy starts to activate other parts of the circuit, they might draw a lot of current. And so uh, when this can't react fast enough to the changing current, it uses these capacitors, which we've spread everywhere, uh, as kind of like local batteries. So there's a, only a tiny bit of resistance between the VCC and ground and this capacitor. So rather than getting all of its current from up here, which is already trying hard enough to keep up with the rest of the circuit, it'll just get a little bit of power from here. And by distributing these all over the circuit, we basically decrease the amount of ripples in the power supply because everyone can store a little bit of energy closer to where they need it. Uh, it's really important that, and it's unusual to find this for something in a schematic, but uh, these decoupling capacitors, which you see here and here and here and here and so forth, they need to be physically and geometrically very close to the thing that they're decoupling. So here, you would want to make these wires as short as physically possible. Uh, that's to reduce the resistance between the capacitor and the chip. And finally, just in case it's not obvious, the reason we call them decoupling capacitors is because they're basically decoupling the power supply of different parts of the circuit. We're making them depend less on each other. The second last thing we're going to talk about is the crystal. So unfortunately I had to use yellow here, but here you can see uh, the crystal attached to the microcontroller. Now all microcontrollers need a clock signal, which is basically just a wave that goes up and down, where depending on the circuit at either the up or the down, uh, it will run an instruction. And then it will do that over and over and over and over and over. And that's how your computer works. So uh, we need to provide this clock in these external pins using some sort of oscillator. And in this case, we use a crystal oscillator, also sometimes referred to as XTAL. Um, for these particular chips, they have a internal crystal oscillator, or actually I believe it's an internal RC oscillator, which can go up to 8 megahertz. Um, so if you need more than 8 megahertz, you're going to have to add an external crystal. Now, just for the purposes of this, I'm going to jump over to the USB schematic because it's a bit more visible. But you can see here that they have a 16 megahertz crystal oscillator, and they have two 22 picofarad capacitors, and then they're both connected to ground. That's all you need. The one meg resistor, it looks like, uh, can be emitted. You can put it there. I'm not going to go into why it's there today. But basically, that's all you need to get it going. The other thing you'll need to do, though, is uh, change the fuse settings on your microcontroller to actually use the external crystal because it won't use it by default, but uh, we're not going to talk about that at the moment. So the very last thing that I want to talk about, which will be very brief, is the UART. The UART uh, is the way that the microcontroller can talk to the computer. We already spoke before about this, this USB thing that basically does some magic and can send the signal over UART via USB. It's really important that the RXD pin, which here says MBRXD, so 
or maybe it's an 8, not sure. But basically that's the microcontroller RXD. Here, when we look at this circuit, it actually connects to the TX. TXD. And that's because when this guy is receiving, this guy has to be transmitting. So we need to actually swap which pins connect to each other. And so to do that, we just swap the order of pins. This is really, really, really important. And uh, almost certainly a lot of people are gonna make this mistake, but uh, it's very simple. You just swap the pins. Okay, thanks for watching. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave some sort of comment or on the discussion board and we can have a talk about it.